wasn't trying to take his job, and I don't have that ambition. Yeah. I like to be a counselor. I like You'll to be... You'll help if he asks. Yeah, and yeah. I will help if, you know, if no one asks. Right. I mean, if I have... <laughs> Hey, what's going on there? What are you doing? Well, you tuned into this one. Of course you did. Why wouldn't you? Even if you've never seen a one-on-one before with me, you're going, wait, how the hell did Christian Harloff get to sit down with Richard Dreyfus? Because that's a clout I got, mother Fs. No, because Richard Dreyfus came in here today, and man, what an interview it was. And I said it on Clatter Live, I'll say it here. Now, I had a plan to go in and ask him about everything that he's worked on. All the movies, whether it's the the Jaws, What About Bob, Close Encounters, um, it, Let It Ride is one I actually did get a chance to bring up. But um, it, there's so many movies that Richard Dreyfuss has done, Stakeout, whatever, Down and Out in Beverly Hills, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, we didn't get too much of, of it, and I regret nothing. And I told him as much, and I'll tell you why that is. We spoke for over this, this interview, I believe, is going to be over two hours long. Um, It was a conversation that started one particular place and then just kept going to different directions. And I said it on live, he was driving the car and I was in the passenger seat along for the ride. And I enjoyed every second of it. I learned things from this man. I was, some things that I agreed with, some things I didn't, Um, but I wanted to hear his point of view on everything. He was honest. He gave his point of view on things that had happened to him in his past, things that have happened recently, things that have happened way in his past, experiences. Um, I, don't even, I don't even necessarily have to tell you anymore because you're gonna have a lot to listen to. So sit back and enjoy the interview with the legendary Richard Dreyfus. Here we go. This episode of One-on-One with Christian Harlow is brought to you by Rode Microphones and My Rode Reel. We've been talking about this for a little bit here. It's uh, the world's largest short film competition. Right now, there are over 1,000, 1,000 short films battling to win $1 million worth of prizes, and you can help by voting for your favorite films. There's drama, there's comedy, sci-fi. They're all in there, so head on over to www.myroadreel.com. Don't really need the www. You guys know that. By now, I mean, you've been using the internet long enough, but it's myroadreel.com. You watch some films, you vote now for your favorite. You like movies, you like new things, you like helping people, go do it. All right, everybody, welcome back to One on One with me, Christian Harloff. Well, this isn't this is going to be a one on one. Mark Riley will be joining us for this one, and, and boy, is he happy! I basically, I gave him a Christmas present. Yeah, this is the best Christmas present I've ever had. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, joining us today is not only one of the stars of the new film Bayou Caviar. He is. And a legend, an absolute legend. When I heard that he was going to be coming on the show, I said, yes, please, you tell me what I need to do to get him in the room. And we've been talking for about a half an hour before the mics came on. It is the one, it is the only, Mr. Richard Dreyfus. Hello, <laughs> sir. How are you? The one. The only. The only. And the, uh, I, just, I just want to say. <laughs> How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. Good. It's good to have you on the show. And I'll tell you what, one of the things that I had mentioned to you off air was that, um, we have, some, we, we have a couple things in common. We mentioned the first thing, but the second thing is what I didn't realize, and I, and I read some of this, so you could tell me that it's full of shit. Um, you were born in Brooklyn, New York. You were raised in Bayside, Queens, as was I. No kidding. I live in uh, Bayside, Bell Boulevard, uh, Northern Whoa. Boulevard. I went to Holy Cross High School. Um, Where'd you go to grammar school? I went to St. Roberts. It was, it was in, uh, like 200, right near Bell Boulevard. Ah, so what years was this? In the eighties? This was in the eighties. Yeah, I went to my first year in in St. Roberts. I think it was nineteen eighty one. Do you know that when I was there in the fifties? Yeah, there was no need for um, temple or church things because T- Bayside was ninety eight percent Jewish and two percent Catholic. Right, that was it. Yeah, there was nobody else, and. Um, uh, except that there were no Republicans or Democrats. There were only socialists and communists. Wow. And so I was a red diaper baby. Okay. Oh, how things have That's, changed. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. I, uh, I go back to Bayside like I go to Temple. I, to me, it's like sacred soil. Yeah. And I mean it. I, I get so moved by my memories and by the atmosphere and it was at a time when America was still 
something of shared devotion. Yeah. And it hadn't occurred to anyone to, to, to divvy it up and let it only belong to the right or whatever. And um, every single guy who had a family in that area uh, was a communist or a socialist at the, at the yeah. bottom and who adored and loved America. And they were the most uh, patriotic people on earth. And they, they had to have fought Hitler twice in I'm Spain sure, sure. and in the Second World War. Then they came home, they were all blacklisted, and they were called uh, premature anti-fascists. Yeah. And when you break that phrase down, premature anti-fascist, it's clearly that you were against Hitler too early. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you were coming, and maybe being against Hitler wasn't so bad. Yeah. yeah well, really. And um, when I became a celebrity, I was invited on various talk shows because I love to talk politics. And I was invited onto a show with Donald Rumsfeld. And it was at a time when we were uh, trying, Carter was trying to expand the amnesty program, and Rumsfeld was saying that anyone who went to Canada automatically deserved to be called a traitor yeah. and put in jail for the rest of his life. So I said to Donald Rumsfeld, can I ask you a couple of questions? He said, sure. I said, if Martin Luther King had been arrested for breaking segregation law in Mississippi in 1960, but hadn't served his term yet, and it was 1965, and everyone knew those laws were nuts, would you expect him to serve his time? And he said, of course not. I said, well, Mr. Rumsfeld, the helicopters have left the building, <laughs> and we have admitted that we were wrong in Vietnam. Why are you saying that these premature anti-fascists, and he got up and he went, Aah! and he did that sound that he later on made famous, yeah. and he left the taping, in the middle of the taping, which you don't do. No, wow. <laughs> and the producer of that particular show was, um, uh, what's his name, the guy who ran Fox, uh, oh, Bron oh. Ailes, Roger Ailes. Roger Ailes. He was the producer of the Mike Douglas Philadelphia talk show wow. that we were on at that moment. Okay. And for Rumsfeld to leave the taping is kind of like pissing on, you know, Absolutely. someone's grave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just don't do it. Right. And just for the couple questions, and you figure, too, A, that he probably... Because you you've been pretty vocal in, in in politics in general. He knew and how and what 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 year would you say this was? Seventy eight or nine. Okay, so still, but I mean, at that, at that point, you were still you were you were, you were a big deal after Jaws and yeah. Close Encounters. So like he knew, so he was just he didn't he wasn't taking it. He was just out, and you pissed him off, and it's it was because it. he didn't have an answer. Yeah, he could didn't have yeah. an answer to this, and neither do they now. Um, them mean wh right. whatever muscle heads left or right are, yeah. are deciding on the agenda so well it's funny you know because I was, I was gonna get into this a little later too but you have like when it comes to politics like I said you're, you're very open about your politics and you're very you, you you don't hold back opinions and you're out there you're vocal something I read also your your mother uh, was a was an activist is that correct mm -hmm. um, does this is it also one of those things growing up that you you watched your parents and you and it just they had a cause was it was it them is it where when did I you... was 11 years old yes sir I said to my mom I'm the luckiest kid in the world she said why I said because I'm white Jewish and American and she said I think it's time that you came into the meetings now yeah because I was clearly going down the wrong path and she was going to make sure I didn't. And when she said the meetings, she meant everyone talked politics until it was coming out of your skin. And that was what we did. And I, I think of these people as the most important designers or contributors to my moral character. Yeah. And I may have come to a split from their political points of view, but I never, never was confused about where that was coming from right. because they were 
the most patriotic, and they had put it on the line twice, and no question about it. And to have their patriotism um, called into question, it, it still infuriates me. Yeah. And there's this guy, David Horowitz, who is a co-founder of Ramparts Magazine on the left, and later on has become, became this great, huge right-wing guy, and he felt it and feels it necessary to question their moral character. How so? What, what does he say? Well, he just says they're disgusting and rotten and lying and okay. filth. And, and um, I, I draw the line at that. And I, he can have any opinion he wants except uh, to, to deny their morality, which helped guide him, David, yeah. to wherever he's going. Um, the only time I left this point of view, in essence, was when Ilya Kazan was being given a Life Achievement Award. Um, I had originally instinctively backed it, and then I went, whoa. And I wrote an op-ed for the LA Times, and I said, if Eli Kazan had not been handed already eight Oscars for best film, best director, best whatever. Right. I might have some uh, patience for this, but I don't. And um, it was said that uh, people held it against him because of his anti-communist crusade. Right. And I say his anti-communist crusade lasted as long as his testimony period, okay. and that he was a serial betrayer. He not only betrayed the other members of the Communist Party that he was a member with, but he betrayed Stella Adler and Lee Strasberg when he went to Moscow and came back with the word. Yeah. And he betrayed all of the people who supported him financially and not and non-financially was on his side for the 30 years w after he decided to retire from sh the film business he wrote a, a memoir and in that memoir he told of how he had had adulterous affairs with the wives of all the men who had supported him for 30 years wow. and the first time they ever knew about it was when they read it in the book what a way to reveal it Jesus. Sitting across yeah. from your wife, you read uh, that book and your right. eyes go up, and I say, this guy is a serial betrayer. Yeah. And I said, if I was going to be there, and I'm not because I'm shooting, but if I was, I would be sitting on my hands because he does not deserve to have his moral character endorsed. Sure. He has none. And Henry Luce, who owned and ran Time magazine and mm -hmm. Life magazine, he hated him so much, and Luce was a right-wing crazo, right? Well, he hated Kazan so much that the week of his testimony, there used to be a department called Miscellany. Okay. And he moved, Luce moved Miscellany to the front page of the magazine that week. So that right in the middle of the front page it said, Last week, in executive session at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, Ilya Gadge Kazan, cinemaker, named 226 members of the Communist Party, period, and then left the subject. And so you know, and I'll tell you, he didn't have to name anybody. They'd all been named. He just did it. Right. So he could be in on it. Right. He was... Yeah. And who he, who he bamboozled were the other members of the guild, the actors, who had been just as basically betrayed by him as if he had named them by name. Yeah. He was the greatest director of his generation, and he didn't have to speak or name anybody. But he, he just yeah, liked it. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, again, I, this this is the thing. As you, are, this is the first time we've ever met, and I can what I what I love about you already is the fact that I'm sure it's like you can go you can go deep, 
you can you showed us an impression of Mel Gibson, uh, uh, Mel Gibson, excuse me, Mel Brooks doing uh, doing uh, impression of actors and he did a little shimmy over in a corner, which, and I saw so much just from talking. It's your body of work. It's something like, I am a massive fan of yours, sir, Thank and you. the things that you've done. Growing Don't up. say sir too many times. I'll have to slap you. All right, can I say motherfucker? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I'll tell you a funny story about yeah. that. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know my mother. Um, so what I will what I will ask you though too is a couple of things. I do want to talk. Let's talk about the movie first because you're in here today. You, um, Cuba Gooding Jr. is somebody that I've also uh, known for a while. Both of you guys, Academy Award winners. Um, now he is. This is his first movie that he is directing in Bayou Caviar, and so this movie you are playing a Russian gangster. And I saw, and I'm as I'm, did you, you haven't had a chance to see it. No, and that's incredible. And Spoiler alert! Yeah, Spoilers. Yeah, yeah. Damn it! Yeah, you're Russian gangster. He's an ex-boxer, and I actually saw him in a movie where he was a boxer in this movie Gladiator back in the day, and I loved it. It was him and James Marshall and Brian Dennehy. He loved it. And it, was, it was just as a high school kid, and so watching him take the gloves back on, but now, now he's got to do this mission for you. Now he's got to do this thing. How did you get involved with this? Because the first thing I want to ask you is with Cuba Gooding Jr. as someone who is directing for the first time, do you bust his balls or do you say, okay, look, it's your first time doing a doing a, a movie directing, I'm gonna help you out, I'm gonna be, because you know, you, you're Richard Dreyfuss, you can help him out, he's probably gonna want some advice from you. Do you say, what do you got for me? Well, first of all, I would never really bust his balls, yeah. only if we were f funding it, all right? Right. But I would never do that. Um, I, we had a lot of fun because when we shot the first shot that I worked, mm -hmm. and it was only a lean-in, no words, just a lean-in to take me out and into light. Is in the club? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, we took it, he yells cut, and then he yelled at the top of his voice, so that people in South Carolina knew <laughs> how happy he was that he was a director. No, I can't believe it. And he went nuts. Yeah. And uh, I thought, okie dokie. Then at least I've got that to fall back on because it, having that kind of enthusiasm underneath you is way, is worth a lot. Yeah. And so I knew I'd, I'd have, you know, a comfortable fall if I, have, if I screwed up. And, uh, and also he had, had been an act. He was an actor. That doesn't always work to what mon one might think is the benefit, because sometimes you get a little paranoid, and you over right uh, over control. But he didn't, and um, he he was so happy doing this that it liberated me, and I felt no need, first of all, I wasn't trying to take his job, and I don't have that ambition. Yeah. I like to be a counselor. I like You'll to help be, if he asks. Yeah, and yeah. I will help if, you know, if no one asks. Right. And then if I have <laughs> an idea, I'm gonna say it. Sure. And I like that, and, and I think it's a good position for me, and if someone denied that to me, yeah because I've had it for the overwhelming majority of my life and my professional life, I've had it, the right to say what I want, and they don't have to listen, but I say it. Well, who's gonna be an idiot and, that's, and, and, and not let Richard Dreyfuss say something at this point? There though? have been such idiots. At this point, though? I mean, come <laughs> oh, on. yeah. Really? There have been such idiots, and one of them was, was such an idiot that I said, when I said, uh, I, I wanna make a couple of suggestions, and then he said, no. And this is recently. Or within Recently the last 10 enough, years. Yeah, sure. In the last Pleistine. Year. Sure, sure, sure. And I, I said, no. Look, no, I just want to say, and he went, no. Hmm. And I said, uh-huh, hmm. okay. And I went to my trailer, and I asked for the producer to come to the trailer, and I said, I just want you to know that I've given my last suggestion on the film, and uh, someone should know that. And she said, why? I said, because I haven't had to earn that since I was 16, and I'm not going to earn it right. again. And I will tell you that this film will fail for the following reasons, and I named four reasons. 
and I said, um, uh, no one on this film has the innate merit or uh, level of excellence to prematurely shut me down. I'm sorry, they don't have the cred. Right. So I'm announcing it to you. I do my job, and that's it. It's not Kubrick. Even then, would you have taken that? Would Kubrick shot you down? Would you, would you still felt the same way? I don't know. I've yeah. asked myself that question a lot about, have you really? about Kubrick. Yeah. yeah, would I have done it? Because I'm such an admirer of his work. Yeah. But would I have liked working with him? I don't know. Yeah. Um, I have heard, by the way, that Kubrick, contrary to popular opinion, was a guy who got to the set and then improvised. Which is great, right? Which yeah. I did not expect to hear. Yeah. I, you know, he's, I th thought of him as someone who meticulously shot and thought out everything. Sure. Turns out he gets to the set and goes, hmm, I wonder what we should do. Right. Like that. And that film he made with Ryan uh, O'Neill, which was lit oh, yeah. by candlelight, Mm -hmm. for real, you think that that was decided, you know, early. Right. Mm -mm. Really? That came about during the shooting. And so it's like Steven Spielberg coming upon another version of Jaws. Yeah. He was planning on shooting a film with a shark. Right. But there was no shark. So he had to make it up as he went along. And he stumbled, but he was a genius at this, he stumbled upon this great way of implying the shark. Yeah. And it made the movie a masterpiece. And, well, we hit that thing, too. And I know that, like, when we were outside and everybody, well, especially the man sitting mm -hmm. me next to here, draws his favorite film, one of his favorite films, if not his favorite film of all time. Yeah, it is. Um, You'd said you've been asked every single question about Jaws that possibly could be, could be, and I don't blame you uh, for all the stuff. You know, it's a classic. The question I do have, and if you've answered it, please humor me and answer it again. Um, if the movie, Jaws, would have failed, right? If the movie, the shark, let's say the shark would have worked and it wouldn't have been as effective, and it was kind of a, a goof, and how do you think your career would have changed? Um, the first films that I got credit for which um, ended with the release of Jaws, came in a jumble, kind of. I was in uh, San Francisco shooting um, uh, graffiti, yeah. and then went immediately to, to uh, Canada to shoot The Apprenticeship of Diddy Kravitz. I was in Canada when Cindy Williams called and said, Ricky, you want to be a star? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, go get your ass down to Joe Allen's. You, if you walked in right now, they'd stand up and give you a standing ovation. And I said, damn it, what am I doing here in Canada? Shit. Right. And by the time I got down to, to Joe Allen's, I was yesterday's news. Mm -hmm. and, but then Jaws. So it went bing, 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 pop. Right. And, and you passed on it originally, right? Yeah, I passed on it twice. OK. And then I saw it because, I mean, I did it because I had seen The Apprenticeship of Diddy Kravitz all together into one movie, and I completely lost my mind. And George turned to me and said, what do you think? Yeah. And I said, well, I think it's a wonderful movie, and I think that you should... Uh, cut me out of the film, and I figured out how. And uh, and he said, "Oh, you're crazy," and walked away. What was that all about? Why'd you lose your mind? I had never seen myself on screen yeah. for that long. Oh. I mean, the most I'd ever seen me was in guesting on the Big Valley or something like that, and it wasn't the same. And I just, you know, went nutty. Okay. And it took me years to really see that performance. And, but I was always away when the opening things happened. Yeah. And then I was on Martha's Vineyard shooting Jaws when the New York Times had a two page spread about Diddy Kravitz. Yeah. And all of a sudden, girls started coming out in safety boats and going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Stephen goes, what is going on here? And I said, Stephen, if you had a 40-foot face, you'd get popular too. Yeah. And and it, he, he would have been popular. It would yeah. have changed his life. Yeah. So um, I, it didn't get me laid. <laughs> no. That, I can assure you. Yeah. Jaws did, uh, though. No. Jaws didn't? No, it's because I am inherently a doofus. Oh. I'm not a Dreyfus. I'm a doofus. <laughs> <laughs> so even though my wife says, you were a player, she yeah. says, you were you a player. Yeah. I said, no, I wasn't. He said, oh, I heard all about you. I said, if you heard all about me, you'd know that I wasn't. <laughs> so uh, I, had, I was living at a certain point. I was living with my oldest and best friend. And I came home one day and he says, I am so bored with your virginity. I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> and I have arranged a, 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 a lock, a guarantee. It's a guarantee, Okay. You just gotta show up. And she's sexy and she's hot and she wants you. And you gotta know only one thing. She's gonna say at a certain time of her own choosing the word no. And you are to ignore it. And I went, okay. And I went, and she was really hot and sexy. And she was clearly saying, and we started to make out. And she went, oh, Richard, no. And I said, I'm sorry, and I thank you, and I left, and I went home. And I got to the house, and Carl is standing on the lawn, and he's saying, I can't believe it. I can't believe you. She's already called and said, what the hell happened? I said, Carl, she said no. And (laughs) it was like too much. If he could have, he would have thrown himself. Yeah, it sounds like a Gary Marshall movie. Yeah, that's just about what my life was like. And uh, if I if I had said if I had taken half of my rep, yeah. I would have been the most exhausted nineteen year old in the world. But I didn't. Yeah. I, ju- I didn't. I just everything. I had a much bigger reputation than my facts allowed. For. Interesting. What was it? Just I mean, well, you're. You come off confident. Come off. You're you're funny from from what I've not only from your work from talking to you for the last twenty minutes. That usually works, but it just it just was it confidence wise. I uh, well, false with a pretty girl. Yeah, I would have no confidence. I see. That was it. My tongue would cleave to the roof of my mouth, and I would end up going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When did that mm-hmm. stop? You got married. That's why I got married. To take care of that problem. <laughs> that <was> it. <laughs> uh, it hasn't Smart. stopped yet. That's no? as far as I know. Yeah. And so that's the way it is in this lifetime. I understand. And now that I realize that I'm closer to death than I am to high school, <laughs> you begin to entertain notions that you would have dismissed out of hand earlier, like reincarnation cycles. Yeah. I want this to be true yeah. so that I can, you know, do a better job the next time. It's funny you say that because my, my, my brother recently passed and one of the things, he has this video, he's a musician, and one of the things that he says is that he believes the mind lives on and, and like kind of studied a lot and that. So it's fascinating to hear that. Just It's just when, when as I watched this video like a couple of days ago, so it's in my mind. You know, he, he passed away like a month ago. So. Wow, me. Oof. So, well, you know, thinking of all that stuff, and death, as you get older, death starts to pop into your mind a lot. And is, is that is that your belief, though? You believe in reincarnation, and or you hope to believe in? I'm an agnostic. You are, okay. Have always been, yeah. and probably will always be, in the truth of my heart. Yeah. But that doesn't stop me from going, boy, that looks really pretty. Yeah. You know, what reincarnation, if? what yeah. if, wow. Because you're either on your way to attain something, or you are having attained, now sliding back to start another, or something right. like that, right. Whoever, whatever the rules are. There are no rules. And um, I do know, I accept that there's a mystery in this universe. Beyond that, I wouldn't allow myself to get stuck behind any yeah. word or phrase. Um, I... I have no secure belief that we have anything but this one life. I have no belief that there's any second, millisecond, that lasts beyond death 
and allows reevaluation or anything. Yeah. I hope now that I'm wrong. And I also hope that God's not as nutty and crazy as he appears to be on the surface, at least psychotically. You know, he's got a psychotic sense of humor and he's got a sociopathic sense of empathy, which means zero. And or he doesn't have control of his business. Or he's a, yeah, he's <laughs> right. a bad God. You know, he's not efficient. Right. Right. And I think, by the way, that the tent, that the, what I really kind of almost maybe kind of believe is this. I have a short list. It's a short list you have to really work at getting on my list. And it's right here. And it's those things that I just don't forgive him for. Yeah. So that if, when my little tram comes in from the life theme park, you know, and I've had my, my turn, and there are people in my, in my tram that are already vomiting from the experience, and there are others who are saying, well, let's do that again, yeah. you know. If he's anywhere on that platform, I'm going to hit him in the mouth. <laughs> I'm just going to hit him one slap for all of us, you know? Bingo. Right. And I know he knows. I know the whole argument. I know that he knows already, and I know that yeah. he knows that I know that he knows and all that. But I'm talking about he deserves it. Yeah. You know, he's... Is it like a worldly thing, or is it a personal thing? Or both? It's both. Yeah. It's both. I mean, public and private. I yep. mean, yikes. Um, how... What's the definition of neurotic? It's doing again and again and again the same things in the same pattern, hoping to achieve a different outcome. That's called a neurosis. Yeah. Well, that we've been doing that with uh, God for thousands of years. Sure. And he or she or it or Gaga ga, yeah. go go <laughs> go. Um, that was my favorite, actually. He, it, she. It doesn't ever let up, you know. We make the same mistake, and then we make it again in there for reasons known only to it, him, her. Why doesn't he ever have a sense of forgiveness? Actually, yeah. I take that back. I don't have a clue anything about anything about him, right. it, her. Except that if him, it, her exists and is actually morally involved in our lives, I'm going to hit him. Right. Mm -hmm. Because he, it, she deserves it. Okay. Um, and that's, listen, there are a lot of things. I, th I would say, I mean, this is a bigger conversation because I do want to jump back a couple other things here. But I do, I do think there is, forgiveness-wise, I think that you could say for a lot of things that we've done, there is forgiveness. Because if you wa wanted to, poof, we're gone. Right. Do, does it so? Maybe there is some forgiveness there, but I think there are a lot of things that I wake up in the morning and I say, "My brother, my brother was thirty-seven years old," and I say, "Why? Like, why? It was his time. Was it really?" But, ha but I don't know. But I mean, uh, yeah. Knowing that I'm intruding on truly sensitive ground because yes, you, we're not talking about a hypothetical yeah. here. There is something I learned as a little boy, and that was, "Why is is a silly question." when it comes to God. There is no answer. Um, the ways of the Lord are mysterious is the only answer thus far that has any you know, weight yeah. to it. Um, but if we say that he has knowledge and uh, moral involvement in every, way, every chirp of every bird, etc., right. then it's beyond our ken. And we always forget how young we are. And there is a, uh, an incredibly talented historian named Paul Johnson. And he does this like this. He says, man basically knew until the middle of the 19th century who he was, what his relationship was to his God, to his work, and to himself. Basically, He's known this, yeah. and it's just a question of the name and the slant on it in particular. Yeah. 
But we know God's up there. I'm down here. This is my work. Right. And we argue about his name all the time and kill one another in for, then, for that. And then we wonder what's on Netflix and we forget about it. Right. Yeah. So um, now, yeah. then three Jews came along. <laughs> right. And Karl Marx said, you don't know your relationship to your work. Actually, he said, you don't know your relationship to your dick. And then... Freud said, you don't know your relationship to yourself. Mm -hmm. And Einstein said, you don't know your relationship to God. And one, one Gentile, Darwin, said, you don't know anything mm -hmm. because you're an infant and you just dropped out of the trees yesterday and you're too young to understand the universe. Right. And thus we entered the age of uncertainty. You and I, as members of Homo sapien, we like to move from certainty to certainty, mm -hmm. forgetting conveniently all the uncertainty in between those two certainties. And it's like a picture of the Philippine Islands. Just imagine they got 6,000 separate islands in the Philippines, mm -hmm. and you've got to get wet going from one to the other. And that wet, that's called uncertainty. Right. So we can't move from the certainty of paganism to the certainty of monotheism without getting all wet and splashy in the uncertainties, okay? And when we are young, and we are young, all of civilization, according to science, all of civilization that we know about is only within the last 50,000 years. Right. And 50,000 years is a hat. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's it. Mm. The, the dinosaurs prevailed on Earth for 500 million years. Yeah, people never, I mean, it's funny, when you, when you talk about it, you don't take in that time right. at all, right. how much time they actually ruled the, the And just yeah. imagine the restaurant franchises that must have existed, <laughs> you know. <laughs> wow, corporate law, holy. Right. Right. So yeah. we're literally just beginning and yet, we have the arrogance or the hubris or whatever to say, and this is the answer. Right. No, it isn't. Right. Well, it's the same thing when people had the answer that the, you know, the world was flat they, back then. Yeah, they and even then the they answer. were saying it after most of the world knew that it wasn't flat. Correct. So it depended upon which, which part of the stupid world right. you were in. Stupid world over here or over there. Right. Well, it's just, I think that's the, the thing in general is that people... I think as humans in general, they don't want to change. I think there's something inside of us that they don't they don't want to accept certain things. And right. I think that that's that's probably what. And it, it's human yeah. nature right. not to want to because that means you have to you have to get on top of all yeah. of the detail of the minutia that that change will will cause. Yeah. And if you, uh, it's like you know, I, I'm I'm involved si with civics, bringing civics back to the grades below high school mm -hmm. graduation. And one of the things we know is if you walked, if you had the need of a lawyer and you walked into someone's office and did not see on his wall a diploma from a law school, mm -hmm. you'd get up and leave. Right. And if you didn't see um, uh, the evidence of a medical diploma, you'd get up and walk out. And yet, we hand the running of this governmental system, which is infinitely more important and more detailed than either the law or medicine, over to people who have had zero training in running a country. Do you think that's also a problem, I mean, to play devil's advocate, because I happen to agree with you, but like devil's advocate on that side is that both sides seem to have agendas as opposed to fighting for us, because absolutely not. You don't think so? Nope. Okay, because like from my my from what I would look at too on one side when it comes to like the Hillary Clinton side of it, because I know a lot of people that didn't want they didn't want to vote they didn't vote for Trump they didn't vote for Hillary they voted for somebody else, and that ultimately was a vote for Trump mm -hmm. because they didn't trust Hillary and they didn't trust what they're putting in front of them inside of that. I heard there were so many people that were yeah he's an asshole but I can't vote for her. And I just don't know if there's any leaders right now that people are. Well, I'm talking about from my side of things. When I, how I'm looking, I mean, you might have you clearly have a very different point of view. But I, but as far as who are the leaders that we can follow here, because I think both sides need help. First of all, we're talking about leaders, or are we talking about employees? 
because our representatives work for us. Mm. Yeah, that is that is accurate. <laughs> yeah, right. It is accurate. Yeah. It? Yes, it is. So our, let's say our so our employees because I there are, we have they're not they're not listening to us they're they're not listening to their to their bosses and they're and they're they're going around the company and they're they're penny pinching from the company and they're taking from the company and yeah. they're doing it with both sides and we let them do that why we do don't. we do, let them do that that's my question and that's why because we don't know where to go and we don't have anybody to look forward to okay look that's to. my starting point yeah we have to teach our people in other words tutor the sovereign in what is deservedly uh, knowledge owed to both and all sides. It isn't necessarily that we are limited to two. We could have five. It doesn't matter. What we should have is a working knowledge of the Constitution and its operating manual, right. the Constitution manual itself, the Bill of Rights, which are values, which came from a specific time and place, which was not agreed to by one other place in the history of the world until we took it upon ourselves to claim them. And until a hundred years after us, they were still con mocked and scorned until we proved that we were right, right and they could all go to hell. And the poor, the common people, had been treated by the, those that were in power you know, overseas those that believed in monarchy by divine right mm -hmm. or inheritable uh, aristocracy, uh, both of which really do resemble what I'm about to call them. We lived under monarchy and aristocracy for what, 10,000 years? Yeah. Five to 10 to 15 mm -hmm. to something like that. All that time, um, it was an arbitrary decision to let some ancestral achievement bless a certain family for so long that they could inherit their, its power over and over again and keep it from you. Or that one bloodline uh, received a revelation of divine right by God. <laughs> and you couldn't question that. Right. Now, in fact, both of them are punchlines. How long did it take us to discard the value of monarchy or aristocracy? 100 years, yeah, 150 yeah, years? Yeah. But it's a punchline now. Mm -hmm. And that's important to know because that's for how, how long we allowed ourselves to be knockered. And those are the people that said that learning Learning anything was under the criminal code. Right. It was a crime. And if you learn something, they chopped your fingers off. And that's only where they started. They chopped your fingers, they chopped your feet, they chopped your nose. A chop, uh, the replacement of a chopped off nose is the oldest surgical procedure known to mankind, and it's still in use today. And we um, inflicted it, not with a, a notion of um, equality, right. but at the whim of a local duke, right. at the whim of some you're, schmuck. You're not, a, you're not privileged to know that, so get over here, we're gonna hatch at your nose. Right, right. dig it. Right. And that was it. There was nothing consistent, it was all arbitrary, and we allowed that to happen to us until America said, wait a minute, wait. If you can make it here, if you can make that journey, we not only give you that particular right, we give you more rights than you've ever conceived possible. Yeah. We give you the right to learn, we give you the right to speak, we give you the right to worship, we give you the right to tell everyone to go to hell. We can absolutely guarantee that the government of this system will be bound and inhibited from oppressing you. Right. And all rights that are not mentioned here automatically default to you, the people. Yeah. Now, that's pretty good on paper alone, right? The minute their feet touched our soil, that was their truth, became their truth. Until that minute, the truth of the world was this. You are a serf, 
your grandchildren will be serfs, mm -hmm. and my heel will always be on your neck. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what you've got to get used to. Now, that was the truth of the world in every civilization, in every empire, in every country, regardless. That's the only thing they all agreed on. And in my book, I'm publishing the penal codes that prove this point. And what's the name of the book? I don't know yet. Oh, you don't have You have OK. Hasn't, OK. I don't know yet. I'm right in, right in the in middle it. of it. Okay. I'm having a lot of fun. It sounds like it. And you have to understand that it, they just wrote it in that said, if you were poor, you got punished. Poverty was a crime. And if you, got, if you were poverty stricken, that's another reason why you should be punished. Yeah. And um, imagine the perfect uh, circle that was. It's like the perfect mafia um, experience. In the novel, The Godfather, they all admire this one family because they've got the perfect scam, which is they have the contract to fix all the potholes, and all of their trucks are overweighted and create the potholes. Right. So they've got the perfect mafia thing. Yeah. Well, so does it happen. So does it happen that in this instance, if you're poor, you are screwed every way you can move. Right. And so the existence of mankind on this planet was, for 98%, a shriek of horror. Right. Not just right, but you don't really get that if you just read history. Historians are culpable for writing about the 2%, right? The leaders, the battles, mm -hmm. the yeah. conquests and not mentioning this is only the 2% and the 98% of the people who made up all the armies were screwed. Mm -hmm. and they don't talk about that, but it's in actuality a truth. So an editor of the New York Times in 1920 put it this way. He said, no matter how many, there's only one war and that is the war between the haves and the have-nots, mm -hmm. period. And that's the truth. Yeah. And so you may talk about Caligula and the Senate of Rome and this and that, but you're talking about the 2%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, let me ask you a question, too. Have you ever th considered or thought about at any point in your life or, or career to go run for office, to run, to go in the... Yeah. You have. Yeah, and, what and kept, discarded it. Yeah, Why, yeah, what kept you out of it? Uh, when Franklin Roosevelt told his mother that he was going to run for the presidency, she said, Franklin, it's a step down. And that was a joke then, and it's reality now. It's an admitted reality because there's a concept called uh, cognitive dissonance. Yeah. It means holding two contradictory thoughts in your head at the same time, okay? Politicians. We agree that they should make our laws. We also agree that they are the most inauthentic class of people in this whole nation. Mm -hmm. That they would not speak the spontaneous truth unless you held their feet in the fire itself, mm -hmm. and then they would scream bloody murder. I'm saying that we have screwed ourselves by not teaching ourselves what we all deserve to know and does not give one side a, 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 a favor over the other. Right. You don't get an advantage to knowing civics except that you get the absolutely impossible to reject logic that everyone benefits. Right. You have to be educated in the system to run the system. And anyone disagree with that? I've spoken in front of 200,000 people at different times in different places in the country from every point. No one, not even one individual, has ever disagreed that civic training should be taught to all. Mm -hmm. Then I go to Washington, and civic training was not endorsed by anyone, mm -hmm. neither the left nor the right. You've been vice president twice, right? 
Is it an American president? And I, I was, yeah. was a senator. He was a senator, senator, and then and then obviously Dick Cheney um, in W. Now I do want, I wanted to maneuver into that because I had two questions about that. First is Oliver Stone um, working with Oliver Stone because I at one point I, and I don't know him because I might, the answer is because I'm ignorant to it. Um, for a long time, I felt that he was on this side. And then I'm seeing him doing interviews with Putin and, and doing all this stuff as far as uh, – and it just I don't know where he lies right now. I don't know any of that because I don't – I clearly – like I said, I'm ignorant to it. But when you worked with him, um, how was that experience first of all? Um, did you get along with him? And were you on board right away to, to do this movie? Uh, w, that is. Yeah, I wanted to play Cheney. Yeah. And um, – and we had a, a mythically bad experience. Mm -hmm. And then about six months ago, I picked, I wrote a letter and I said, you know, Oliver, I'm 70 years old and I don't have to do this anymore. I don't have to carry this unnecessary baggage with me. Oh, you guys had problems on the set. I didn't, I didn't, yeah. know, okay, I didn't know about it. And we just, we didn't get along. Okay. So, um, but... I wanted to know, for instance, more about the Putin interviews, yeah. and I uh, would bet dollars to donuts that there's more to gain from a friendship with Oliver than from being his enemy. So I, I initiated that, and uh, he's responsive. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. He, we're we're starting afresh. Oh, that's great. So okay, um, the thing about. Uh, adults and adulthood is not a, a date and it's not even a season it's the willingness to say I am I, I was wrong or I I didn't I uh, I was wrong I'm sorry and uh, I hadn't thought of that okay. the willingness to be vulnerable to your mistakes is the mark of an adult. And I think I've been turning into an adult since I met my wife. And we've been married now for 12 years. 12 years. And she, I mean, you mentioned even before, it's just, she's kind of just changed the way that you've looked at yourself, at life in general. Is that pretty much? Yeah. yeah? yeah. Because and, you can't um, really have a love that isn't about sharing. Mm -hmm. And you can't really share unless you're willing to admit that you might have flaws and be wrong or right, yeah. depending upon the circumstances. And so when I, when I got together with her, I joked to my friends that I had taken Yes, Dear class. But I had. Yeah. And I learned immediately that there were many, many things that formerly I had fought to the last breath to defend, and then I realized, who cares? Yeah. What's the difference? I gotta take a page out of that book. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, and men in general, I think, men, you add it all up and it's pretty much exactly the same. Men and women, all things being equal, are equal. Mm -hmm. That we have to learn how to be adults, and it's not gonna happen unless you want it to happen. It's like a 12-step. Yeah, a program. Well, you did that. So, it was was Oliver Stone the only person that you did that with, or did you did you make kind of like a list and say, look, this is some of the things? Because again, I don't know what happened on the set of W to where maybe you felt you were in the wrong, you felt he was in the wrong, but it seemed like you didn't care. You wanted to just say, let's let's hash this thing out. Were there other people in your life that you wanted to do that with, or was? And I did. You did. I tried. Yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, I uh, I had. An experience once that although now I look at it and realize the rarity and beauty of the moment, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy because when I bring up a memory that involves emotion, I relive it yeah. as if it was happening at that moment. And I had a narrative about myself which was that I was a pretty good guy. You know, I was a pretty good guy. And I hadn't really been a malicious person. Um, I was in my 
60s, early 60s, when I first was putting this thought together. Now I'm 70 years old, which is literally like talking about Twilight Zone. It just has no, makes no sense. But I'm 70 years old, and I'm looking back at my life, and all of a sudden I realized that certain stories that I had told myself, I had connected through certain dots, and I was wrong, fundamentally wrong, about some of the most important relationships I've had exclusively with women, women who I would have sworn up and down I did not hurt. I knew I'd hurt them viciously. But you chose not to believe that the, the, the first run? Is that what you're saying? I, it never even occurred to me. I see. And so then I realized that I hurt them all in the same manner, and that's when I'm driving down the 405, and I had to get off the freeway, park the car, and broke. Yeah. And well, what was can I say? Was it just like you left early, didn't treat them right? Like did you, I mean, if you don't want to get into it, that's fine. But you mean something along the lines of just the way you something along the lines of my first foray into having a relationship with a girl yeah. ended so painfully and kept ending painfully that I somehow unconsciously decided that I'd rather get the hell out of here before that could possibly happen again. So you bailed a couple of times. That was... I ended, but I didn't end by saying goodbye. I ended by acting like a, cra- like a creep oh. or not. But it, I just ended. And sometimes, the way Simon says, there are 50 ways to leave your lover, yet somehow the common denominator was that their corpse was lying bleeding yeah. And I was gone. And I realized that I was full of shit. And I I really had to get myself together and get a better understanding of my own life. So I went home and I tried to write a letter to all of these women who I had worshipped, I'd loved for real. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and the letter which went out was received with a basic kind of, uh, that ship has sailed, pal, click. You should have have made the call or you should have wrote the letter years ago. It was basically a long time. I shouldn't have behaved that way. Oh, so even if you would have apologized, even two days later they wouldn't have cared? Well, it depends upon the circumstances. But in general, I shouldn't have behaved that way, shouldn't have been that blind, should have been much more aware and responsible of my actions. And um, I reserve this kind of savageness, savagery, for only the women who deserved it, the women I really loved and cherished and thought I had treated like, you know, perfect. Yeah. I was, like, my self-knowledge was in the toilet. But that stuff, though, that you went through and that you were going through at the time, I don't know, times in your life that, because it's, it's, it's out there, it's public knowledge that you, so you, you took a break from acting for a while, I think from like 82 to like 85, 86, is that correct? No, 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 no. no. I took a break years later. I, oh. I, I didn't take a break. When I had my scandal. Y- yeah, okay. I had an enforced, uh, you know, no one hired me for a couple of years. Okay, so that's kind of what I th- so because I remember from because the, the the movie that I love that I was going to talk to you about it was it was Down and Out in Beverly Hills. It's mm-hmm. one of, I mean it's one of the first movies I remember that I wasn't supposed to be watching as a kid that I watched and and my dad always reminded me of Nick Nolte in a certain way. <laughs> so I was like, I'll watch this, and you're you're so phenomenal in that movie. It's 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 and that was one of the movies that was kind of the, one of the big ones back. though. Is that correct? Right. right. Um, that's kind of what I meant. So throughout that time, and when no one would hire you during that time, is that during that time some of that stuff that's happening with these relationships? No. No. Okay. At that time, whatever uh, caused me not to be hired, um, I knew I understood it was attached to that the scandal of being arrested and all this, yeah. and of holding. Uh, a small amount of drugs, 
And if they had known how much I had on me at the time, I would still be in federal prison yeah. even now. <laughs> so, um, but I, I thought of myself in, with the same commitment to acting that I had always had. I see. And so, no, it did not happen then and there. And maybe it, it, I mean, when I look back on it now, I think, it would have been a nice thing for all the people involved yeah. if it had happened then, but it didn't. I see. But the reflection of like when you so when you say you're on the four or five and you and you kind of break down, is it that thought process and the way that you process those particular thoughts? Does that also help you in your in your process of acting too? Like to be able to really because you got to tap in, like you said, when you're going because that's the first thing I thought of when you're like when I bring back that emotion, it's happening again. You've got to use that tool in your yeah. in your work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But again. If you asked me to describe my process of work, yeah. how I captured or recaptured whatever a, a character, I would, I would want to chuckle yeah. because I have not a clue as to my process. I don't have even the slightest idea of how I do what I do. I only know really? that I love it. And my love for acting has been re-layered and re jiggered and made stronger and stronger by various events that have happened to me, but none of them have ever illuminated my process. Mm -hmm. And I can only tell you in metaphor that somehow my, my character is across the room hanging in a closet. And I have to walk across that room, open the door, put on the costume and feel it fit me. Okay, has that told you anything about my process? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that's all I got. Right. And the character's got to speak to you, you put it together, that's how you dress it, and then you go. You do and uh, it's neither less, and it is a great deal more. There is an inherent nobility to being an artist and to being an actor. Um, when I first realized I was deadly serious about all this, Yeah. I would spend all of my time with other actors trying to get them to speak about it from the same point of view as having understood the nobility of it all. When was that though? Was that you were, were you a teenager or were you Yeah. Or, yeah, okay. And I was literally without a break from the time I was 9. I was in the kitchen with my mother and I said I want to be an actor, and she said, "Don't just talk about it." I love that. Yeah. yeah, she was great. My dad was the same way. He was just like, you know, if, that's fine. You do what you want to do, but you got to commit to it. Right. You got to put everything into it. And you got to get there and do it. And and I, we didn't get into it. We we stopped talking about it at the beginning. You were in Queens, you were based up, but then you moved, right? You moved to L.A. and you started there. You started in TV first, then got. I started at Temple. Oh, okay. I started uh, uh, doing plays at Temple Emanuel. Oh. And the plays that I did were, I played Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism, so I had a full beard at nine, <laughs> and the smell of spirit gum will always be very Jewish to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I also played the ghost of the Assyrian soldier who constantly tries to blow out the Hanukkah candles all through history, <laughs> and that was in a musical version, and... <laughs> I then went on to do high school plays, okay. and then I started to do TV, and the there you go. There you go. The transition happens. So. But um, I want to ask you about one movie that I love, that, um, and then I want to ask you about something really serious. But the first thing uh, there's that I love, that I have to talk to you about, it's a movie. And you, do you know what I'm you, what movie I have to ask him about? Because this is something that I was, I used to, when I was in Queens, and I would get back from high school, you know, they just they play these movies on cable, and some that I shouldn't be watching. And, and this movie used to come on, and I loved it. I don't know how you feel about the movie. Uh, Let It Ride. Mm. Um, Hysterical, and you're a degenerate gambler. I am. Um, <laughs> I love that movie. Yeah. yeah. You were so just engaging in that thing, and just watching, I can watch it, if it, it holds up. The delivery of it. Did you have? Did you have an absolute blast making that movie from start? Because it looked like a blast. Yeah. Yeah. W yeah. What do you remember about it? Well, I remember everything yeah. about that one because 
I was able to get my mother a job in the um, VIP lounge, you know? So that was hot, that was great. And um, it was also the only film I've ever done where I didn't have to change my wardrobe. Mm. It all took place in one day, one day yeah. and I had to wear very comfortable clothing. Yeah. And I loved that because I hate changing clothes. Yeah. So, um, and also that it had a very distinct and unique comedic rhythm, as as unique as Catch Twenty Two was for by Joseph Heller. This um, novel and screenplay was unique to itself, and that was so exciting. I played the TV pilot version of Yosarian in Catch-22 mm -hmm. when I was 19 or 20, and it was written with Joe Heller's great timing. And then, after I had signed, they threw that whole script out and replaced it with the most boring, mm. derivative, TV-style jokes that bore no resemblance to the novel. Yeah. So I was in a funk and a fix, and I was in arguing. I was arguing with adults. Yeah. And I remember one night out in the desert, the unit manager got drunk, and he calls me over to, my, to this table, and he says, Dreyfus, <laughs> you have more power than anyone else on this whole film but no one is going to hand it to you. And I knew a profound truth, and that was I knew he was right, and I didn't understand w how to describe my situation. I didn't understand how to describe that or get out of it or to do anything but whine. And and I knew I was just too young to understand what he was talking about. Does he mean that I can hold my breath until I turn blue and until people start doing what I want them to do, or what? And I didn't know. Mm -hmm. This is the process where you were saying earlier about how this is earning it. This was earning being able to, yeah. 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 And I had to earn that and to really understand. And I didn't really understand the whole concept of consequences and preparation. Someone mentioned out here before we started mm -hmm. that they weren't gamers. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know one area of gaming that w you would hold your attention. And what I meant was this. You can walk into any gaming store in the country and get, yeah, do you have the Battle of Gettysburg? Oh boy, yeah, lots. Do you have any that deal with the consequences of that victory right. by the Confederacy? Right. No. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you got a battle, but you, but it's you know adrift right. without any connection for or f before or after. The guy who discovers the algorithm for gaming consequence is going to be the next billionaire. Because Write it's, that down and start working on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. It's not the Battle of Gettysburg that's important. It's how the world would have dealt with its consequence. Yeah. And we entered a war in our lifetime. We went to Iraq and Afghanistan without any appreciation of the consequences. And we spent our own children's lives doing it. And at a certain point you say, wait a minute, this is fundamentally a wrong thing to do. You don't spend my kid's life learning something. You don't, you don't do that. And you don't pretend that you know something when you don't. And that's what we've been doing in America. We yeah. have been pretending to be America. Well, you said that, and, that's, and, and I'm going to ask you that then. It's a good transition here, too, because we talked a little before we started recording here, too. And you have a very... Um, stern opinion on the press and you have a very and, and as far as the way that things are presented and 
So there's some news about you that came out not too not too long ago. Um, some accusations, things that were were put out there, and I wanted to give you a chance to tell your side of the story here, or things that you wanted to um, that you felt that was maybe either accurate, inaccurate, and whatever you whatever you wanted to talk about the situation. Well, let's let's go back to us. A simple thing. Let's do away with one part of this. Sure. Um, um, I was walking down a street with a friend of mine, an actor who I have known basically my whole professional life, and he's great. And I was telling him that I had broken up with my girlfriend. And he said, when did you do that? And I told him, and he said, Wait a minute, didn't you just win the Oscar? I said, yeah. He stops on the street and he says, and you moved from L.A. to New York, right? Right. And you, uh, this is the first time you've ever lived with a girl? Yeah, right. He said, Richard, didn't anyone ever tell you that moving, birth, Death, success are the times when you've got to hold on. And I said, no. Mm. And he said, well, the, the horses are out of the barn already, but I'm telling you now, those are the times when you've really got to have an understanding of what's going on in your life because you got to hold on. And I realized that that fleeting second, that I had blown this relationship for no known reason, but for a hell of a lot of unconscious reasons. And do I believe in the unconscious? Yes. And did I love this girl? Yes. And did I know what I was doing? No. And I've done a lot of things in my life which have had terrible consequences on me. And I have to say, at the end of the day, I take responsibility for my life. I would rather have made the uh, I, I, the decisions in my life rather than follow someone else blindly. I'm just, that's the way I'm built, and that's the way it is. When, in terms of money, I have complete lack of understanding of money. I have friends who can monetize air. They can, that, that word monetize now haunts me like some grade B, you know, Vincent Price word and monetize. <laughs> I can't monetize anything. And I can't, I, I can't collect successful love affairs. I can only connect, collect torturous self-deceiving love affairs. And I have lived my life as responsible for my own decisions, yes. Too many of those decisions have been destructive of, of me and mine, and to an unacceptable amount. It's just not right. And I have no one to blame but me. And I remember one night, walking with my son, Ben, and we were talking about how I, I really did have an ambition to be a good guy. That was a known ambition in my life when I was 11. I want to grow up to be a good guy. Mm -hmm. And that meant being a good guy to girls and boys and everything. And I hadn't been, and I could be better. And he, for instance, he said, did you know that you smirk when you smile? No, I don't. Yeah, you do, Dad. I know you, and I know you're not smirking inside. And he sh we went up to a, you know, a window, and I looked at my face, and sure enough, my muscles in my face were, sh were giving off the body language of a smirk yeah. when I smiled. My smile is... And there you go. Yeah. So I'm smiling my life away and smiling here and smiling there and I'm smirking at people. 
No, 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 no. And so I learned something that night. And I'm, I've tried to learn things like that a lot. And with women, I have been a complete failure because the women I have most cherished in this world I have learned what Spartacus learned in gladiator school is known as the slow kill. It, it's, it's not enough to make you drop right there, but it's certainly enough to kill you slowly as you bleed out and you can do real damage during that time. Mm -hmm. And I have slowly killed so many women and I don't mean it. And you know how pathetic that sounds when you're writing a letter, I didn't mean it. Right. So, so I know that this life of mine is a learning experience. I hope to God there's another one <laughs> so that I can put some of this to use. Yeah. But I know that I've kept learning about women, about God, about me, about why I do what I do and why I like what I like, to a great extent. Mm -hmm. And it has consequences. So first, I want to take care of one thing. Sure. We could start a company right now mm -hmm. called Consequences, mm -hmm. and we can come up with games that deal not in the battle, but in the consequence. We could start a company. Yes. Okay? And. The consequences, let us say, of the Japanese land 15,000 troops. Yes. That would have, give it some thought, that would have pushed the war back to the California coast. Mm -hmm. That would have put the end of the war sometime in the early 50s. And did we have the guts and wherewithal to do that? Um, when we got to the home islands, when we got to Guadalcanal and, I mean, uh, Okinawa, etc., yeah. we were talking about a war that was so much more horrible that we had already ordered 750,000 coffins for our own side mm -hmm. before we ever invaded the home islands. But if Truman had decided not to drop the bomb, and we invaded the home islands of Japan, we were, arguably, the two most xenophobic countries in the world, right. the United States and Japan. Imagine them going to war with yeah. one another. At the end of that war, they're going to think each other are insects. And it would have been a, a, it would have been a life lesson to be neutral about it that we would never forget, and there wouldn't be any Japanese left. We right. would have annihilated the entire race. And the difference between what really happened and what might have happened sometimes is simply the intake of a breath, mm -hmm. and that's it. And so I think it's a very valid thing to learn history by what didn't happen as well as by what did. And for every moment in history, there is no agreement as to what that means. And I once got into an, uh, uh, an argument in, in um, Vienna, and I was talking to a table full of historians, and I said to them that when I told stories, my mother would say, you're not telling stories about the family, Richard. You're telling variations on a theme. And I said to my mom at, le at 11, well, that's what we historians do. <laughs> and then this historian got pissed off. In real life, this woman said, excuse me, uh, you're talking to historians. I'm a historian. These people here are historians. And we don't do any such thing. We deal in facts. She got mad at an 11-year-old. And I turned to her. And I said, excuse me, you don't do any such thing. You do exactly what I do. You have a tale to tell. You suppress the facts that don't support your tale, and you raise up the facts that do. And if what I'm saying 
is not true. There'd only be one person sitting at this table. The fact is, history itself is completely unknown except to the people interpreting it. And that's why there's no such thing as uh, the best history on that issue. There's always two, at least. And I really took her to task. And you can't talk about history, individual or otherwise, without understanding that. There's no story in my life that is not my story. Right. And maybe the experiences of my life cause me sometimes to change the tale, but I can't change the facts. I gotta change the interpretation of the facts. Right. Now, in, in my life, I had a whole slew of women that I had just only recently discovered I had hurt, and I'd hurt badly. And so I, and so I, I'm just gesturing to my wife who's telling me not to tell things in, in public that I should keep private, but that's not what I do. Um, so, no. I had hurt these women. I can't deal with the world in any way without taking some responsibility for that. And individually, with deep and grievous regret, a number of those women are dead and have died thinking of me, unfortunately, without the affection and niceness that I would have hoped. Yeah. So that's that part of it. Well, I mean, but from what we've been talking about here, too, the reflection and what was also said was that how much you have been an influence in his life to where now like you, you've you been looking at these things, you reevaluated these things, you've now found these things about yourself that maybe you wouldn't have found years ago that you have found now, and that's shaping you as you get older in, in, in life, and you're starting to reflect it. It's because do you feel, like you said, when you were looking at yourself to when you said, I want to be a good man when you were 11 or whatever it was, you feel you're getting there? Do you feel like you've you've hit, you've because because I I will say though too I think people are hard on themselves too. You might have gone through things. I think it is the man that goes through life. And again, I'm 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 still figuring it out. But I think it is the man that goes through life that says, "What did I do wrong? And how do I fix that?" That can still be the good man. Absolutely. It's the man that says, "I like what I did, and I'm going to go out doing that way, and I like all the bad things that I did, and that's who I am." That maybe owned it, but went out the bad man, or said. You may interpret the things that I did as being bad, but I don't, and I don't think I've ever made a mistake. There are actually people like that. Yeah. And I hope that I'm not any of those people, and I hope that I can learn from my life on the last day of my life. Yeah. And and I probably and I think I probably can. Well, every I mean can. And I did say yeah. that a lot of it was due to falling in love with a woman who comes from a completely different culture and who demanded that I be as good or as interesting a guy as she thought of before she ever met me. And we have spent the last 12 years in a constant dance yeah. of improving and and actually improving who we are to one another. I love it. I mean, just hearing you, so you remind me of somebody, my father-in-law is, is, says a lot of the same things to me. And he, said, he says that you're going to get to a point in your life, there's going to be a lot of reflection. There's going to be a lot of things as you get older. You say you may approach it way differently when you're 40 years old. It's go, do this, don't worry about it. But you have to reflect and understand that there's more things in life than just hitting the road and going forward, you've got to also look around and who's around, who you're affecting, all those types of right. things. And that's, that's the conversation that I'm getting out of right. today. Well, I remember when I was a kid, I went to school at my temple, and I took what we called confirmation classes, although that's a word that is usually used for Christian um, traits. But I, I went to seven years of classes in Jewish history, Jewish debate, Jewish issues, and learned that those things like there were other tactics other than a forward aggressive, yeah. that there was negotiation, right. that there was ta uh, 
um, tacking and compromise and flanking, and there were ways to engage maneuver. or disengage, yeah. manu- maneuver, 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 <laughs> and uh, those things were, in essence, in the short kind of graphic novel version of things, mm-hmm. um, invented by Jews to, to survive in this world. Yeah. And because you never knew when arbitrarily someone was going to say, and you Jews, get out. Right, right, right. (laughs) So we had to develop what they called mobile tools. The most mobile of them were the intellectual tools. So we learned this. And there's nothing wrong in flanking and tacking and negotiation and compromise. And then all of a sudden, Jews within the politics of their own community began to say... Uh, anyone who negotiates and compromises is a coward. And that was, whoa, hold it. That was not, right. that's not Jewish thinking. That's kind of simplistic, primitive thinking. So I have an argument with all of the, the Jews involved with Jewish politics right now. And, and uh, as my daughter and my wife have told me, you have this way of dealing with civics from an outrage and a pain and an anger and you forget all the time that you have that you're charming and that you can also reach people that way if I can what I will say about that is that I have I've known you now for maybe two and a half hours and now I'm not talking about watching you from when I was young knowing that you've been charming I have I can attest to that you are charming. You are uh, influential. I've already learned so much about myself throughout this inf- this this interview. But no, I, I but I think that when I was talking to you earlier, to where you see, you didn't have this confidence. We didn't. There was it's like kind of self doubt inside of it too. A lot of it. But there's there's it's amazing like how much you keep learning about yourself throughout your life. Like no matter what you think, well, I know who I am. Do you ever really? Like that's I guess that's kind of the, the theme of this of this show today. It's like, do you ever really know yourself? Yeah, there yeah. there are times I have had a, a number of experiences. I wish I could say I had more of them, but I've had experiences of revelation, experiences of of uh, blinding clarity, and uh, there's a phrase used in the movie Network. Mm-hmm. When Robert Duvall, uh, yeah, Robert Duvall is asked, um, did he really understand this issue? And, he, and Duvall says, with pristine clarity, he mm-hmm. says. And I, I think I've had a number of moments of pristine clarity. Yeah. And those are things that I can safely say I understand now. Like, for instance, the notion that, uh, for me only, if I have no secrets, no one can hurt me. Yeah. And I really believe that to the point that it's a guiding principle of my life. And the moment I first thought it, if I had no secrets, nobody could hurt me. I then became an adulterous lying low down dirty dog and and just lied my way through my life for two or three years and then I went wait a minute gave it up and have kept to it and there are there are lies I tell myself yes but no lies toward others right and and as I checklist my way bucket list my way through my life I will try to do better on each one of those. And yeah, I am, uh, there is, a, there is a, a ride in the theme park known as Richard's Life mm-hmm. that is so exciting and that I'll, I'll spend all my extra dough to do it again. And it's me going through my mind. My mind is as enormous as the stars in the universe. I can tell. 
<laughs> I'm telling you. Man. Well, I yeah. was a conscientious objector, yeah. and when I when I tried to get that status, that was the guiding principle. I said, I'm never, I'm not going to lie my way through this. So I, in fact, thought that I was going to be turned down, and I wasn't, and it was a shock, yeah. because I had adhered to no secrets, no lies, nothing. And I got it. Yeah. And when I finally met Svetlana, I knew and said, a man is not mature enough for a true, loving, sharing relationship until he's in his 50s. Everything else is practice. How'd you guys meet? Magic. Magic? Total magic. Total magic. And there's no way that we should have and could have, but we did. And... We were at a party one night, and separately, someone asked her how long we've been together, and she said, 10,000 years. And she said, go ask Richard. He'll say the same thing. And I did. Yeah. I didn't know that she'd said that. Really? Yeah. But they said, how long have you been together? I said, oh, 10,000 10, years. Well, and they thought you were, like, planned it out or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't that. It yeah. was that I believe it. There's a part of me that has taken on part of Christian mythology mm -hmm. and believes in life after death, in archangels. I have met so many angels in this world, I can't count them. And they're all named angel, yeah. oddly enough. And they have saved my life, saved her life, and I can't... I, I can't convince or persuade you, nor do I wish to. I can only say that I have had the experience of meeting people who were not people. Yeah. And when I turned away and turned back, they were gone. And I mean gone to the point that I actually looked under the cars. They were gone. Really? Yeah. And um, one of the games that I'm talking about mm -hmm. in terms of consequence... Yes. I invented a game called The Shaman, and it's the most expensive game you'll ever buy because it takes years for them to load it up, and it is a game that when you put it into your computer, you've done the last controlling thing you'll ever do oh. in terms of The Shaman. You can't control it after that at all. He comes back when he wants to, and he comes back to offer his services as we would to a shaman that we would want the, ch the chance of achieving some sense of inner harmony and peace and like that. Mm -hmm. And that's why you play this game. Yeah. You'll play it for 30 years. Yeah. He comes when he wants to, but he lives in your files and knows you. Wow. So if you come and give him a shock about why you can't talk to him now, he can say, how long are you going to watch that pornographic film anyway? <laughs> you're, gonna, you're wasting my time. And he'll say, if you do this another time, I'm never coming back. Right. And he doesn't. And you should put out $10,000 for this yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you engage him, you go through the experience that you would with any really good spiritual teacher. Right. And that's why the most you'll ever get out of him, once you have achieved some real inner journey, is, hmm, that's it. That's, that's it. all you get. Um, we have talked basically about none of your movies, I regret nothing. Um, except we did talk about the, your movie that you've coming out on October 5th with Cuban Jr., correct. Um, is there anything, because we've been talking, I know your lovely wife is, is, is waiting, um, is there anything that you want to touch up on that we didn't cover that you wanted to, because we, we jumped around on some stuff too, so anything, because I know you said do, beforehand you wanted to talk about stuff, explain some stuff, nothing. I was thinking, I was thinking and am thinking, but I don't think we, now that she's here, I don't think she... she don't have to. Let's move but, on. But I must say, I'm so tempted to do it, okay. because no one who has been in this experience as the victim uh, has spoken up 
And I, there's something about being the first guy to do that that is very appealing to me because this is a problem that is not just between men and women or amongst women or about women. This is about our human ability to create such a mountain of denial that we don't see what is right in front of us. And it's a human trait. We've been doing it for millennia. And until we really start to deal with the truth of things, what is and what isn't, what is the proper, who's, who's, what issue are we really dealing with here? I spoke to uh, guys who write for uh, television who came out to Hollywood, I totally believe, as the ones who wanted to write something that so pissed the president off mm-hmm. that they, want to get her, they, they wanted them arrested. <laughs> and I think Tom Fontana and uh, David Kelly and, and Steve Boschko are, are people like that. And I have heard them deny it totally. They say, oh, no, 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 we're not interested in that. And I say, bullshit. Yeah. And I've told them, those three guys, at one time I said, didn't you ever get the feeling that you'd planted your flag on the wrong battlefield and you're fighting the wrong war? And they said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you've been talking about, you know, getting a motherfucker into primetime TV or getting a nipple, a vision of a nipple. Right. And I'm thinking, sex, what's the point? Because it's inevitable anyway. We're going to have pay-per-view and all that. Or death, we'll have that. The running man. Yeah. yeah. And I, so instead of that, didn't you ever want to find the, the cause or the issue or the approach that you could vividly describe in drama that really got the vice president into trouble? Yeah. Or whoever and really exposed a flaw, let's say, in the government. Really. And all of them denied wanting to do that. And I say, that's the reason you came here. That's the reason when you were 11 years old, you felt you wanted to be a writer in Hollywood. That's, I think, part of being human. Mm -hmm. And you want to be the best human you can be. And and take down an enemy who is worth it. I was introduced once to a federal judge. He walked up to me and said, hi, I'm a Republican federal judge. And I said, hi, uh, throw some villains in jail. And he said, I will. I said, I'm not kidding. We need it. Throw some villains in jail and put some heroes up to be praised. We need it as a culture. And... So I, so he said he would. I have not heard from him since. How long ago was that? Do you remember? Mm, Fifteen years. Oh ago. wow. Okay. So he didn't put any villains in jail. Yeah. Yeah. There's a before and after in my life. It's when I met her, uh-huh. and I had already retired out of Hollywood, and I was in London, um, preparing to go to Oxford, and I had submitted. They told me. You submit an issue to us, and if we agree, you can research that issue here. And I gave them the damage that was being done to my country by the absence of the teaching of civic authority. And they said, yeah, good, come. So under that title, I went to St. Anthony's College at Oxford for what turned out to be four years. The first year I attended every day, basically. And then I met Svetlana and attended less and less, <laughs> you know. But I was there. Yeah. And um, because I didn't want to be a celebrity with a cause or be unschooled in what was so important to me. And if, if you had to nail me or compartmentalize me, you could say that I'm a Frank Capra American, mm-hmm. that I am a Kiss the Tarmac America, American, and that what we introduce to the world 
was the most revolutionary, the most important political revolution in the history of civilization, bar none. And right now, the odd thing is, having been raised on the left, that the modern left are people who so hate liking America for any reason that they, they act like children and they actually support notions that attack the First Amendment. And if, the first time I ever watched TV news and saw leftist kids not allowing a right-wing speaker on a campus, I wanted to retch. Yeah. Because that's who we are. Right. And that's not who we are. Hate speech is like... No, it's not, and you know what's funny? It's not just the hate speech, the things that you see. And I, I, I've talked about this today, too. I think social media is the, is the death of us. I really do. I think that the problem, I think, yeah, you can say some good stuff and you can get some good message out on social media, but I feel like people are just throwing rocks at people and there's no, and there's no, it's like. Now, you know why that's happening? Why is that? Because we're not taught an alternative to that behavior. We don't teach an alternative to yelling and screaming and interrupting. That's, we think, is the norm. It's not the norm. It's an extreme position. But without teaching civil discourse and civility, where the hell are you going to learn it? Right. And if you don't learn it, if, if you don't know that it exists, if no one tells you how to be the sovereign power, you ain't. You've given it up. Yeah. And if no one tells you how to actually have civility in your public discourse, then you don't have it right. and you're not going to know it when you stumble on it in the dark and that's what happened to women who had been really hurt and harmed in the real world by um, a millennia of rotten second, -hand, second class citizenship to finally feel that they were going to they, they couldn't take any more right. of it right and the press, the press said, you want to heal that wound? Go down that corridor and open up that door and you'll see the way to heal the wound. And they went down the corridor, opened the door, and committed character assassination. And that's what it was. If the guy's not there when you make the accusation, it's a character assassination because in our system, the guy's there and you can duke it out, okay? Right. And you call it anything else, and what you're doing is saying that there, we have come upon a crime that is so terrible that it's worth throwing out due process of law. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, there's no such crime that has ever been discovered, including serial killing and the Holocaust that is so terrible that we have to chuck due process of law, which has taken all of the history of mankind to reach. Yeah. Habeas corpus and th that character assassination, you don't give that up. I don't care, take a number, get in line. And, and Dustin Hoffman said this easily and was, instead of being supported, he was made fun of when John Oliver attacked him one night for some behavior. Dustin said, and I don't know Dustin, but I sure agreed with this. Never He's, met Dustin? No, I've met him. Oh, I've but met him, but I don't know, know him. Well. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. I said, uh, he said, John, we were trained to this behavior. And John Oliver said, oh, how pathetic, Dustin. Well, how pathetic, John. We were all trained to this behavior. We were trained to disrespect girls. We were trained to the nth degree. And you can only uh, think that the alternative of respecting girls and treating them with the respect they inherently deserve was a culture, a cultural phenomena supported by the culture, only if you're deaf, dumb, and blind, because that's not true. If you treated girls to the respect they deserved, you were called a geek, 
and a nerd, and you were culturally scorned by boys and girls. And if you're a girl, when you're 14, 15, 16 years old, there is no class, there's no book, there's no mentor to tell you how to find the six different definitions of the word no. You gotta do that all by yourself. And those are known as puberty rights. And they're different in every culture from the Amish to the French court of Louis the Sun King. In the French court, men showed their ankle as they walked because it was a sex object. Okay, it's a very awkward walk, mm -hmm. try it. <laughs> and <laughs> what? and uh, in the Amish con uh, country, you are encouraged to have sex before marriage because you've got to get to know if you're compatible. And the parents make a show of, well, we're going to bed now. And they go to bed and they expect the kids to have sex. Now, here's the fact. Men and women will flirt and have babies. They will do this. They will flirt and screw and have babies, regardless of marriage or not marriage, regardless of consequence. These are evolutionary compulsions, and it will, they will be accomplished. So get behind it, pal. Get behind it now. It's just a question of style. And in general, there is one idea. In the San Francisco earthquake with the fires breaking out and all of the buildings falling down, when you're running to the river, that's not the time to stop and say, it's the mayor's fault. That's not the time. You do that later. And so everything that was done in the last year by the Me Too movement had to overlook some felony they were committing in order to secure the felony committed against them. And that has to be taken seriously. And I was told at one point, you know what the real feeling about you, Richard, is in Hollywood? No, what is it? Richard just doesn't get it. Well, I would say, not only does Richard get it, Richard gets it better than most, and I will discuss this anywhere, anytime, any place. But understand that I think that women reduce their value to themselves by reducing themselves to this, this argument. They're more than women who have been mistreated by men. They're American women with an ethical and historical relationship to the values of the Enlightenment. And they have been deeply ingrained within the DNA of their system to engage with one another on a, on a hugely fair basis. And that fairness was not culturally supported by any nation in the world who thought that education of any kind was a crime and the, the powers that were would have come over and happily strangled us in our beds before letting these values out we let them out and we became the most popular and most respected country in the history of the world. And we did not make a gender exclusion. Now, in fact, we did make gender exclusions, pro-men, you know, as we always have done. But those are the kind of invisible sins we don't even recognize. They're so vast. They're so outrageous. But when asked, that's when you say, Mr. Rumsfeld, hello, remember me? I say, you're more than your accusation. You're far more than that, and I am too. And what wasn't discussed at that time, last November, was the person who laid a, an accusation against me, it never occurred to her to pick up the phone and call me and say, Richard, did you know how badly you hurt me? And I would have said, what? I did not. Did I? And she could have pressed the point and made it clear, and I would have burst into tears and felt like a slug. And that's the appropriate way to have done it. 
not about Harvey Weinstein. I'm not talking about felonies. I'm talking about mixing felonies with misdemeanors, mortal and venial sins. You put us in the same walk, right. and that's inherently wrong. You haven't even figured out what the crime was, and you're putting me in with a rapist. And you have seen an effect as far as work because of this, as where it's on, like you said, character, maybe assassination you feel that it could be, or it was something that affected you immediately because of, because that phone call didn't happen. The conversations didn't happen. There right. was no, so do you... I feel that on the day, yeah. as a matter of fact, I was uh, the first... I think the first accusation was aired on November 7th. I was scheduled on November 14th to make a speech at the Smithsonian Institution. And I got a call on November 10th, canceling. Mm. And, I, and they made it, made it clear that it had nothing whatsoever to do with the story in the papers at that moment that I had been guilty of right. this and this. And she called me finally and I said you can call it anything you want but know that the world will see it as an, uh, an institution that has no political bias blinking in the face of an accusation that is being heard as a verdict and that's something we spent thousands of years finally arriving at a better way. And that was the establishment of this government. And think of it like boot camp. Yeah. You really want to defend re representative democracy, Republican democracy, then think that taking a class or to be exposed in true um, enlightenment values like the Bill of Rights, that's not a classic passive classroom exercise. That is boot camp mm -hmm. where you're learning the musculature of Republican democracy. And it's why when Adolf Hitler said the same thing, he didn't want negotiation, no compromise. He wanted your submission or death. Mm -hmm. And he came all the way to the Atlantic Ocean before we finally woke up, understood we had to go there and kill him. We went to defend what we called our way of life. Our way of life was the, a knowledge of the Bill of Rights. Just that knowledge. Yeah. That was enough to defend against enemies foreign and domestic. Now we have an all-volunteer army, which means mothers have no political power over the directions that army takes. And that army is filled with guys who do not know how to either read or write because we've been passing them up and out of the system because teachers realized that those classes, those tests, were testing them, not the students. So they started to cheat on it yeah. to keep their jobs. And now we have an all-volunteer army with no political control, with people in it that are so uneducated that they do not know how to read or write, write an order or execute it, and they're saying that's a good outcome. That's not only not a good outcome, it's the worst possible outcome for a geopolitical entity like right. a nation state. If we can be populated in our military by people who can't think clearly then why, are we ha why do we have all these bases all the way around the world in every possible nook and cranny? Why do we have a military-based empire out there and not admit that we have it? That's what we got. Yeah. We don't talk with any authenticity anymore. We don't have an understanding of who we are, and I've invented the following phrase. Every people has a right to know who they are and why they are who they are. And if we withhold the knowledge of who we are to ourselves, from ourselves, we're dealing from a stack deck against ourselves. We're treating us as a mark. And where does that become vivid and 
insane yeah. at any point on that compass. We no longer think that we are obliged to teach our own children the best they can possibly be. The American dream is we pass on to our children a, a country better than the one that was passed to us. And we have admitted that that is no longer possible. Then what are we doing? Right. I, I see. I, I, I'm. I guess call me call me an optimist. I believe that it's possible. I believe that that we that we still can do it. I think that there's a way that we can do it. I think that there's a way that we can. I think we're the most divided we've ever been in our entire uh, history here. But I um I do believe that we can all get on the same page. That's why I brought up to you earlier. Right. I just think that we need the right leadership. Well, but, what you need is you need the right starting point. We never guaranteed life, liberty, and the, and, uh, the pursuit of happiness as uh, as a way of life. We understood it to be the way to give everyone the right starting point. The children of aristocrats and mm -hmm. the children of common people all have the right starting point. There's no guarantee of where it comes out. And what we create when we publicly school is that starting point so that we're all taught the same reading, writing, you know, a little yeah. English lit, a little mm -hmm. poetry, <laughs> right. a little home ec, and, and the values behind the Bill of Rights. Yeah. And those are specific because they were not agreed to anywhere on this planet except here. Right. So there could be no other place. When I hear people talking about homeschooling, I say, I'm afraid of homeschooling because who's gonna teach those kids the Bill of Rights, if it's not coming from their traditions from their own mother country, and they're not, the mother country chopped their grandfather's fingers off. Right. So where are they gonna get that experience? And I've known women, um, uh, parents and grandparents to walk into public schools and say, I don't want my children exposed to opposing views. And there have been some principles so stupid as to actually stop debate. Right. Well, when do you prepare kids for the tough ones? Where do you prepare your children for dealing with life at its most horrible? Because life is not pro-American. Mm -hmm. Life is gonna happen, period. And we'd better have them trained to some comfort zone with the worst. What we did in Philadelphia in 1787 was some of the people there at that convention decided to raise themselves up above the norm and understand things above the norm so that they could create something above the norm. Yeah. And if you don't, you can't and you won't. And what happened to the the goal or the the idea that we could actually reach for a nobility of, of goals and achieve them you can't do that right. if you don't if, if you don't prepare you, right. yourself yeah and that's what how in politics it's shown itself in government it's shown itself and now in hollywood it's shown itself and it's going to show itself in academia in farming, in every aspect of our lives. Because what we're doing is raising up the worship of medio me the mediocre, the, the no big deal, the who cares. Yeah. Who cares? History cares. Yeah. The human race cares. And if we are going to in any way admire Elon Musk for going into space, as a private individual, you think we're gonna get there with a populace of people who are just a bunch of cows? No. This has gotta be a daring adventure. America itself is hard and it's a risk and you could lose things like complacency. America is tough. It's never been done before. So let's do it right. And with that, because your lovely wife has been waiting here, and I also, I could talk to you 
And I'm going to call you one more time, sir. Last time, I promise. For ever. You have um, you've enlightened me. You have been honest. You have shared moments of yourself um, to where I didn't expect, and it was welcomed. I appreciate that very much. Not only did I tell you when you sat in here today how much of a fan I was of you in your work, but I'm a fan of your honesty. I'm a fan of the, the way that you, like the reflection. I'm going to take that with me because I've, I've heard it from two people I really admire, my, my father-in-law and you. And to be able to sit there and look and understand your mistakes and understand conversation and to understand just love. I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much for you coming in here today. I also want to let the audience know that you did come in here today to promote the movie that you are uh, in uh, Cuba's directorial debut in Bio Caviar. It comes out October 5th. It's in th uh, theaters as well as on demand. The great Richard Dreyfus. Please, 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 the next time you can, come back and talk to me again, because I don't want this to be the last time I talked to you. I had so much fun. Even though I know how to make an exit, yes, sir. I'm going to do one thing, make it a little messy. I have a website. The website is thedreyfusinitiative.org, TDI, thedreyfusinitiative.org. Go to that website. On it, you'll see a thing that says, sign the preamble. The preamble is the mission statement of the United States. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a series of recommended actions that are so general and so agreeable that I don't know any one or group of individuals who could not sign the preamble. Right, left, tall, short, thin, fat. Sign it. If I get 225,000 signatures, I'm going to call it National Civic Strike. 30 minutes coordinated by time zone so that everyone stops at the same millisecond. And during those 30 minutes, nobody goes, phones, drives, buys, writes, studies. Nobody does nothing for 30 minutes. Not enough to hurt the economy and certainly enough to get their attention. And it stands in as a demand for a return of an enhanced civic curriculum. And until and unless we stand up on our own feet and say to our employees, our representatives, who are work for us and who have a better insurance policy, a better uh, a retirement package, a better everything that they've given themselves and deny to us, our own employees. I say, we don't deserve a better government until we can articulate it and demand it and get it back. Get it back. Boy, will that make everyone feel better. Well, how that, that was an exit. <laughs> that was an exit. All right. Richard Dreyfus, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, and again, thank you for being as honest as you have been. And, and I hope that not only, and if you have been, guys, if you're brand new to Mr. Dreyfus's career in general, go back into his library. Watch this man's work. Watch all the stuff that he's done. Listen to him stuff. Let, go to his website. I'll be looking forward to the book when you have a name for it. And look for the book. Thank you once again. I truly, truly appreciate you coming in today. Yippee for me. That was it. That was the interview. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're joining us for the first time on Collider Video, hit that subscribe button, like, comment, do all that stuff. And remember, this is also on iTunes. If you're listening to iTunes right now, pull over and then rate it, subscribe it, do all that stuff. Hit pause on the treadmill for a second and let us know what you think about these shows. And we will continue to make more of them. You can find all your favorite shows from Collider on iTunes on the Collider Podcast Network. Thank you very much. See you next time.